Hey guys, what is up? Super Cayman Rocks here, and I am here for my week two LCS recap, overview, analysis, and of course at the end, and I guess at the beginning of this one, my power rankings. If you have not seen the last two videos that I posted to the channel, the channel update and then the LEC week two recap, um, I am back. Hello, welcome, welcome back. Um, I am full-time back making these videos. Again, uh, I actually have some help making the visual graphics, which was a huge hindrance for me in the past to work a full-time job alongside doing that. And so I am back. I am able to make these videos again, go over how I feel about all four of the major regions as well as NA Academy. And, uh, yeah, I'm very, very, very excited to jump into the LCS here. Of course, home turf for me, a North American uh, if you guys are excited for this, please let me know down in the comment section below. I don't usually ask this before the video, I usually wait till the end, but if you do, go ahead and find yourself liking the video at some point throughout. Uh, go ahead and leave it a like. Um, it really does help me out a lot, and, you know, these videos on my comeback, the better they do, the, uh, the you know, the more I understand that you guys kind of want me back, and I know you're, you're, the comment section was a big reason why I came back in the first place, so... Uh, yeah, I don't want to waste too much time, so let's go ahead and jump into week two action. I will not be going over, uh, week one in depth, but up on your screen right now, you are going to see my power rankings both from the beginning of the season, like pre-week one, uh, on the left there, and then on the right, you will see where those teams have changed since week one. So, um, definitely some, some risers, some fallers, uh, some, I'm not going to go over this too much in depth. We'll be going over all 10 teams, um, you know, in the games that they play. So I don't want to go over all the changes or anything like that. We will be talking about them throughout the video, but you can see where my opinions were at the start of the split and then where they've gone since week one, kind of going into these games. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into our first game of week two here of day one. It was a battle of winless teams as we saw Dignitas take on the surprisingly 0-3 Cloud9. Of course, they didn't have their roster entirely here in Week 1. They did not have their bot lane. Uh, King and Destiny were playing, and quite frankly, they weren't very good. So C9 gets their full roster here, and they are able to pick up a, uh, a nice win here against what I believe to be probably the worst team in LCS right now. Uh, a lot of people were really mad at me in my spring power rankings for having Dignitas so low. And uh, because they had that big lock-in performance and River played really well. And I was just, I was not sold on the rest of this team of being like actual LCS quality. And we're kind of seeing that here. Um, they definitely have a couple of good performances here. But overall, nothing that can hold up to a team like Cloud9. Uh, C9 played really well though. Um, this is a team that, you know, obviously their first game together, they look really good. This bot lane is a huge improvement. I, I was a little bit interested to see how Sven would work as support. Not really concerned, honestly. I would see his playstyle playing particularly well as a support. And, um, him and Berserker seem to have really good chemistry in the bot lane, which I think is really good. It showed in this game, the Senna Tom Kench was, was good. Um, and obviously, you know, it, you, you pick that bot lane in order to stay in games for a really long time. They never really get outscaled no matter what. And that's pretty much the exact opposite of the Lucian Nami bot lane. I quite like, uh, Senna Tom Kench right now in the meta. Um, but for C9, just a good overall team performance. Um, Dignitas kind of had this game in their hands a bit. I don't want to, you know, undersell that Dig was playing kind of well and then, you know, essentially through the game because their comp just isn't that good, um, but we'll get into that later. Uh, C9 does a good job of coming back. A lot of that is just due to Kale scaling. Eventually, Kale is going to get online, and Fudge did eventually get online and was really a big factor in the end of this game. He is going to be my player of the game here for Cloud9. Blabber also had a really good one here on the Wukong. I don't want to take that away either. Uh, his Wukong game was actually really, really solid, and I thought Jensen on LeBlanc, obviously one of his better picks historically, uh, looked really, really good here. Um, overall, C9 looking better. Obviously, going 0-3 in Week 1 is, is concerning, but the the fact that a lot of that, I think, was just, wow, their team is just not here, and Blabber had a little bit of a down week, which he does tend to have every once in a while. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't pulling the plug on Cloud9 after Week 1. Uh, for Dignitas, they had this game in hand. River and Blue actually played really well, I think, for the most part in this game. The Volleybear Zero combo uh, was, was really strong. Volleybear... Uh, River, I should say, got uh, some early leads and did pretty well to keep those. And then Blue was actually team fighting really, really well late game. 
Uh, he almost single-handedly won this game for Dignitas, but just couldn't pull it away. The Gangplank was doing essentially no damage, and the bot lane was uh, as irrelevant as you could possibly be towards the back half of this game. Uh, really, you could give the dud of the game to a few players, but for me, I'm going to give it to Neo because it just felt like that Lucian did absolutely nothing in this one. That's the worry when you pick Lucian, especially into something like Senna, is if you don't win early, you're just not going to scale pretty much at all, and that's kind of what happened. You pick this comp where you're like, okay, well, we have a bot lane to play around early, and then we have a Zero and Gangplank for scaling, but if Lucian doesn't win early, uh, then... I don't know. I don't, I don't really know how you're going to win these fights with Justin Azir. Obviously, you need your Gangplank to play better. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, it's not the worst game of all time for Dignitas. They had it, and they kind of just threw it away. You know, the classic D D Dignitas special. But uh, it's a good win for C9. It's good to see them uh, keep their composure and then continue to, uh, you know, get better as they get their full roster unlocked and, and, and back here in the States. Moving on to the second game here of Week 2, we had 100 Thieves taking on Golden Guardians and a nice win for 100 Thieves here, a win that they should pick up. A Golden Guardians team that just looks not good, uh, definitely not nearly as good as they did in spring so far. Uh, pretty much everybody on 100 Thieves here playing pretty well. Uh, what, I think the draft has a lot to do with that, not that I think it's just like complete draft gap, but I certainly think that they played their comp a lot better and they had a lot easier opportunities here. Um, player of the game was actually kind of difficult on this one because, uh, pretty much everybody on 100 Thieves played relatively well. Uh, you could have given it to Closer. I think the broadcast gave it to Closer. Uh, you could give it to Abadage. Those quirky, uh, rockets were absolutely obliterating the enemy team towards the late game there. But I'm gonna give it to Someday here in the top lane on the Orn. That lane phase into Licorice's Gnar, like, that's not a particularly perfect lane phase for Orn. And I don't think he got hit by a Nar-Q. I don't think at any point in lane phase he got hit by a Nar-Q. Those dodges were absolutely insane. He played really, really well on the Orm. This is a pick that we know he's really good on. Picks like this are kind of his specialties. More of that tank bruiser kind of player. And when he gets a pick like this and can kind of just show it off, like, he looked really, really, really good in this game. But like I said, Closer and Abadog able to play really well. FBI and he also played really well, but they had quite the advantage because uh, Stixay decided to pick Kalista... Uh, while Lucian Nami was up, and so I don't know if Kalista was really ever going to get a chance to play this game. Uh, Kalista's entire role is to win lane phase, and he really just, that's, that's what Lucian Nami does. It wins lane phase, so really there was not much that, uh, Golden Guardian's bot lane was going to be able to do in this one, but FB and I and Huhi played it really well. I know a lot of people are calling the Lucian Nami bot lane bait. Um, you're seeing that kind of thrown around a lot right now. I'm kind of in the middle, obviously, in spring I thought it was bait. But Lucian is a lot stronger than I think he was in spring. I think this bot lane can be really good. And if if you surround it with picks like Corky and Orn, I actually think it's really effective. But um, if you're playing into something really hard scaling, like like we saw in the last game with Senna Tom Kench, I can see where that could be a problem. I don't think it's necessarily like number one, the best bot lane, no matter what, if it's up, you have to pick it. Like it's not a blue side must, but I do think it is certainly a positive lane. So I guess I'm kind of in the middle somewhere there, but 100 Thieves kind of showing off the power in this game. Overall, they just looked really good, really cohesive. They still look like a really good team. I know some people are down on 100 Thieves, but uh, I don't know if I'm one of them. They they definitely still look pretty good, even after their loss to EG in Week 1. As for Golden Guardians, this is not the team that was there in Spring. Uh, obviously, losing a few pieces here, or really just your bot laner and loss, uh, does hurt. I definitely think you're replacing him with the worst bot laner here in 6A. That's not to say I think that 6A is awful, because I actually think 6A played really well when he was filling it in Academy last split, but uh, I just, I don't think it's an upgrade. Um, a Blaze Olive hasn't particularly jumped out to the start of this split with uh, the perfect, yeah, the perfect uh, games. Uh, Pride Stalker as well. These guys just aren't playing, I wouldn't say perfect up until this point. We know they can play better and we're, you know, we're hoping they can play better, but I know a lot of people are going to give dud of the game here to a Blaze Olive for some of these Azir plays, but honestly... At least he was trying. Like, that's where I'm kind of at with a Blaze Olive, where, like, he'll make some bad plays, but at least he's, like, trying to win the game. It feels like this Golden Guardians team sometimes just wants to roll over and die, and a Blaze Olive is kind of the one that doesn't want to do that. I'm going to give it to Stixay. Again, the Kalista pick is just absolutely nothing. You cannot blind pick Kalista if Lucian is still up. You're just going to lose lane phase, and then you're going to be completely useless. I mean, unless you're, like... Tactical or Danny or someone who's like really good on that champion like that is one of your champions Then I just don't think that Kalista is really a pick that you should be 
rolling with in such a confident blind pick capacity. Pride Stalker played this game quite poorly as well. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a lower KP on a Volley Bear in a long time. This was Power Farm Volley Bear to the max. I'm not really sure he participated in much, but, you know, that's all right. We want to see him be a little bit more aggressive. This was a problem he had coming into this year as well. Uh, you know, in EU Masters, he was a little bit too passive sometimes. We saw it a little bit in spring, but we definitely saw it in this game as well. And then, like I said, with Licorice, she just kind of got outlaned by someday early on. So not much Golden Guardians could do. It looks like they were just the worst team here. I'm not pulling, like, the complete panic trigger on Golden Guardians yet, but I'm certainly not confident that this is, like, a top six team uh, going into playoffs. Uh, you know, maybe they could squeak in in that seven or eight range, but uh, I'm certainly not convinced that they're in the top six. As for 100 Thieves, it's good to see them kind of get back on track after that loss earlier in week one to EG. Um, you know, you have to beat up on these lower teams in order to kind of solidify yourself as a top team, and 100 Thieves has always done that relatively well, so... It's good to see them continue that trend here in summer. Moving on to our third game here of week two. We had TSM taking on Team Liquid, a battle of two of the more premier organizations in North America. Not going the way you would expect with TSM actually picking up a pretty big win here off the back of pretty much everybody on the team living up to uh, some of the hype that maybe some people had for them at the beginning of the year. Um, and, uh, Team Liquid, definitely some questionable parts, but we'll get to that. Uh, TSM played this game really well. Honestly, if you had to ask me, you know, what, what is the ceiling for this TSM team? I honestly would not have been nearly as excited about what that answer would have been a week ago as I am after this game. Because this game shows that they really can beat a good team without, like, needing them to throw the game as hard as possible. Yes, TL didn't play perfectly, but... You know, this was this game was really just in TSM's control. It wasn't necessarily TL had it and threw it away or anything like that. TSM controlled the game and, and was were able to kind of just outplay Team Liquid for most of this game. Uh, player of the game was actually a little bit difficult for me here. Uh, I know Broadcast gave it to Spica. They love their junglers here in North America. Uh, for me, it was clearly Mia. Those old slate game were, were disgusting. I'm not sure if he should be allowed to get Renata the rest of the season. His Renata was disgusting to watch. He was so phenomenal. This uh, looks like a huge upgrade from Shen Yi, uh coming in here in summer. And that was something that you just didn't know about. You didn't really know what you, to get from Mia or what to expect from Mia here. But we're seeing him come in and we're seeing him be a really, really nice addition to this TSM team. Maple coming in. Uh, this was easily his best game of the split so far. I was not sold on Maple uh, coming in at the beginning of the split. Um, I know a lot of people were excited because it's Maple, and of course this is a guy who's been to Worlds many, many times, but you just watch the last three or four years of Maple, excluding that one year of PSG Talon where, of course, he was really good. You know, there's five good players in that region, and they're all on one team. Um... Like, excluding that one year, he has been really bad in the LPL. He was awful, awful, awful last year for anyone's legend. He hadn't been particularly much better for LNG before that. So, um, yeah, I wasn't really stoked about Maple coming in, but this is kind of the what you would hope to get is a really proactive mid laner that can open up the map and not need a lot of resources in order to be successful. Uh, Huni in the top lane, I thought played this matchup rather well. It's, it's, it's an exciting matchup, like the Nar Olaf if you get jungle attention, which they didn't. So, eh, you know, whatever. Um, and then Spica was fine. Spica was really good. He was opening up the map. I don't think he necessarily like, completely out-jungled Santorin. I thought Santorin actually had a pretty good game, but, um, you know, just generally a good performance here from TSM, but especially from Mia. I thought Mia was, was really the standout here of, like, Mia played really, really, really well. Tactical was fine. You know, I'm not you know, gonna say that it was all him, uh, but, you know, he's, he's certainly someone that performances like this get me a little bit more excited because he really just has been a shell of himself ever since coming to TSM, so, uh, moving on to Team Liquid, just kind of a mad game from them, they didn't really have it from minute one, they kind of just got outscaled, outplayed, outprioritized, uh, the bot lane definitely was, was outplayed, uh, some really curious plays here from Hansama in this game on the Ezreal, uh, you have Blink, and you have Flash, and you're still not trying to get out of the Renata ult. And that causes his death, at, like, more than once in this game. Just very, very curious decisions. He is going to be my dud of the game here. He's been good, obviously, since coming over from the LEC. I was honestly maybe... It's weird to say I was expecting a little bit more from him because he was first-team All-Pro in spring. But 
this was a guy I expected to come over and absolutely dominate the LCS, and he's just been good. He's been one of the best ADCs in the region, nothing that has been absolutely dominant. I think a lot of that just has to do with Team Liquid as a team not synergizing in the way that I expected them to. Um, not that any of them are playing, like, badly, just that I don't know if they're as cohesive of a unit as I would have expected. Um, getting out macroed here by TSM is definitely a question mark. Um, Santorin, I thought, had a pretty good game. He was kind of the bright spot here for Team Liquid. Uh, he was creating plays where he was trying to create plays across the map. It was just, uh, TSM was doing a little bit more. Uh, Bjergsen with the curse of not being able to play against Maple or any international mid laner coming back to bite them. Uh, and also, what's the other joke I need to make here? Oh yeah, Bjergsen win trading to get TSM another win. Um, there, those are there. Um, Whippo, I don't think had a particularly good game either, but, uh, this is, you know, a kind of a boring matchup. Uh, if you don't get a lot of jungle attention, Olaf just kind of has to sit under tower and do nothing, so... Um, you know, just generally a meh game from Team Liquid. It's not, I'm, I can't be as enthused and talk about, you know, where they went wrong as much as I could. Some of the teams in the LEC recap yesterday, because they really aren't playing as badly as I think some of the teams were in the LEC. They're just not necessarily being proactive. It's really the team that gets that lead and, and is able to control the map. It's just able to snowball that out of control here. And, and, and that's really what TSM did in this one. So props to them and a really, really good win for them. Uh, not a season-changing loss for Team Liquid, but definitely a confidence-inspiring win here for TSM. Moving on to the fourth game here of Week 2. We had Evil Geniuses taking on Immortals. Uh, a very interesting game here. Uh, there are certainly some talking points that I think a lot of people are going to take away from this one. But EG does take it. It takes a little bit longer than you may have hoped. Uh, mostly because Lost is just kind of playing out of his mind here on the Zion, just kind of keeping the game alive, making it really difficult for EG to do much, but, uh, generally a really interesting game to talk about, mostly because of the builds on both sides. Uh, that's really gonna be, like I said, the talking points of this game. We'll start with EG, we'll start with Danny, and this Misfortune build that has finally made its way to pro. We've been seeing it in solo queue, we've been, you know, everybody's been seeing it in ARAM, I imagine if you've played any ARAM, um, this Misfortune build is disgusting. Um, you know, I, I think it's really effective. Um, these 80 carries that can kind of go a little bit hybrid here because the AP mythics are so good, um, are actually really scary. Like, Leandri's on Misfortune is really scary. And if you go that into Mana Moon and then I believe Danny Witt Cyril does this game, uh, that's, that's a scary build because you're kind of getting a little bit of everything. You're getting the burn. You're still getting damage and lethality here from the Mana Moon. And then Cyril is just going to help with all of that. Um... You know, I, I like it, uh, and I like the experimentation here. Uh, it really works. Uh, Danny's not my player of the game. That one is going to go to Vulcan. Uh, Vulcan's Rakan is nasty. We've known it for a long time. His engages were really, really good. Uh, he was a big reason why this Immortals team had a lot of trouble team fighting and why Lost couldn't save the game here for Immortals. But um, everybody played fine. Inspired on the Wukong played really well. Impact in the top lane played well. Um, a good game from EG. A lot of people are going to be talking about Immortals in this one, though. Um, Power of Evil is the other build that I think a lot of people are going to be certainly questioning. Power of Evil is certainly no stranger to weird Oriana builds. I can't remember when this was, but, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, he was pulling out, like, the jungle item Oriana with, uh, Nasher's Tooth. Um, it's certainly a little bit of a different game now than it was back then, but still experimenting. Uh, he pulls out the Rift Maker in this game, wants to go for that more sustainable tanky Oriana. Uh, that's, that wants to heal. I'm not exactly sure what that does for you, especially into the Silas matchup where even with Rift Maker, even with Rift Maker, you're probably still not going to outheal Silas. Um, so certainly an interesting choice of build there. It doesn't really work. Power of Evil does no damage. A lot of people are going to want him to be dead of the series for that, or dead of the game, I should say, for that. But for me, it's Kenvi. Uh, Kenvi has looked, uh, at best, bad. At worst, like, unplayable uh, in, so far in spring. That is not what I expected at all. If you saw my preseason power rankings, I actually had this team as fifth in my pre-summer power rankings because the addition of Kenby, the addition of Lost, the addition of Ignar, like, this team just improved everywhere. Like, top to bottom, I actually think their lineup looks really strong, but uh, Kenby has certainly not translated to the LCS like a lot of people expected him to. And I'm not sure that this Immortals team is really the team that is going to unlock that out of him. They really haven't gotten the best out of their junglers since coming back to the LCS, and um, that worries me, because Kenvi is one of those talents that I really hope he doesn't just get in his own head 
and start to not trust himself, and then, you know, he has these bad games, and it just slowly starts to tilt him and tilt him and tilt him until he becomes, essentially, his coach, Dardock, right? Where it's just like, ah, uh, he's fine, but, you know, some there's just some games where he's gonna run it, right? I don't, I hope that, I, I hope that does not become what Ken B is, because he certainly is someone that you would hope would be better than that, but uh, like I said, Lost actually played this game pretty phenomenally. This was one of the better Zaya games that we've seen all year. He really controlled a lot of the late game, and he was a big reason why this game went 40 minutes in general. He was the only member of Immortals that was actually being proactive and trying to win the game for them. I actually thought he was a pretty huge upgrade here in the bot lane. Obviously, Wild Turtle and Arrow, they didn't expire a ton of confidence in Spring, uh, but Lost was actually pretty good for Golden Guardians. He comes in here. He's played really well for Immortals to start the year. Ignar, you would hope, could be better than Destiny. Um, you, you're just hoping this team can turn it around, right? Uh, I don't, I don't think that this team is necessarily awful, but they certainly have a lot more to show in order for me to think that they are going to contend for top six like they, like I originally thought they were going to do at the beginning of the year. Like I said, I don't know if I said this, but Ken V is my dud of the game. That should be pretty obvious with how I was talking, though. Uh, but a good game here for Evil Geniuses. They've started off incredibly hot. Uh, the post-MSI hangover really just has not hit them, which is a really, really good sign. The regular season was their weakness in spring, so if they're kind of dominating the lower teams, which is who they had problems with um, earlier in the year, um, then that's really good. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm happy to see that, and uh, hopefully they can continue that. You know, 4-0 start is exactly what you want. As for Immortals, you know, they have the talent to turn around. I just... I don't know if I trust in the system in order to bring out that talent. That's going to bring us to our final game here of day one for week two. And that was the undefeated Counter Logic Gaming CLG taking on FlyQuest. And I've been really excited to talk about the CLG team. It's really unfortunate that this is where I pick up my videos. Because a really good week one here from CLG to go undefeated. Bring some hope back to the hopeless. And the first time I talk about them on the channel, they are losing in 40 minutes. Um, this was still a really good game, and I thought actually both teams played really well here. Um, but let's talk about FlyQuest, and let's talk about what they did right. Um, this comp is what they did right. Uh, Twitch Yumi is a really good bot lane. We're seeing it globally a lot more now than we were at the beginning of the season. But uh, yeah, Twitch Yumi can absolutely take over games. You let them get online, you, you give them the time to actually get there. And they're terrifying. <laughs> they are um, something you really don't want to go into because Twitch just has infinite damage and infinite sustain with the Yumi. And then when you have Wukong engages, you have Ari and Jace for a little bit of extra damage on the back end. This is a really scary comp to try and team fight into uh, once the Twitch got online, which is essentially what happened here. Johnson is going to be my pair of the game here on the Twitch. He was the hard carry for FlyQuest in this one. Uh, the Twitch is a really, really scary prospect, and, and he got online. He played it really well in those late-game team fights. Blowing people up, uh, positioning pretty well. Uh, the invisibility is just such a problem for uh, for pretty much anybody to deal with. I was going to say for this comp in particular, but for pretty much any comp to deal with in the game, having that damage buff from the Yumi, having the you know the uh, the uh, healing. I don't know where I was going with that. I just kind of blanked. Having the healing, um, it, it, it's it's really really difficult to deal with. Um, but everybody on this team played really well. I want to specifically point out Jose Deodo and Afrimu. Obviously, Afro on the Yumi, you can, you know, you can say how boring. He played Yumi for 40 minutes, blah, 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 blah. He still played it well. Still was really an, an enabler for this team and, and was a big reason they, they won. And then the engages from Jose towards the end of this game were really, really strong in that Wukong. That pick can absolutely take over a team fight if they get in. And that's kind of what happened in some of those back-to-back -back fights. Shout out to Philip. Um, you know, the Jace dude, he's not, you know, he wants his Camille. And obviously, he gets banned out here. He's kind of a... He, I haven't talked about Philip coming to LCS. I'm not exactly sure if that's an upgrade or a downgrade to Kumo quite yet. Uh, it looks like an upgrade. Kumo was the worst top laner in LCS uh, for the past year or so, but Philip wasn't exactly lighting up the academy scene, so it was just going to be really interesting to see what exactly Philip was going to bring to LCS. He looks like he is a little bit better. He at least gels a little bit better, but uh, he, he does like to play those more aggressive picks, the Jace, the Camille. I haven't exactly seen him on tank duty. Uh, I thought maybe an Orn or something in this circumstance would have been a lot better. But, um, you know, the Jace was actually really proactive and helpful in those late game team fights with the Poke. So, uh, what do I know? Uh, as for CLG, I don't want to say that this game was quite bad. It really wasn't. They were in this and they made a lot of proactive moves. The one move that they're going to get criticized for is giving up that soul. But I think outside of that, their macro was actually really good this game. Uh, my dud of the game is going to go to Dokla in the top lane. 
the NAR just wasn't able to accomplish much. Um, really was a non-factor for a lot of these team fights. You could say the same thing about the Udyr, but uh, everybody on this channel, I think at this point it's well documented my thoughts on Udyr as a pick. I just don't think Udyr offers you anything unless he is like giga broken and you can play entirely around him. And in, I, I don't think this is the meta for that. Um, your entire comp was really just centered around like we need Zeri to take over team fights. Uh, and you're not going to have enough damage to really compete with a Twitch Yumi late game if you let them get online, which, again, is unfortunately just what happened. CLG could not close out the game with enough time left to, uh, to, to stop that Twitch Yumi from taking over. Um, so, yeah, not, not an awful game here from CLG. As for where the team outlook looks, um, CLG looks really good at the start of the split. I'm not super concerned. This is just one loss. You're getting outscaled in a team comp. I'm not pulling the panic button yet. I still think that this is a team that is going to be a lot better than people expect. And FlyQuest actually shows a lot of fight here as well. Um, I think both teams here are going to be competing for that, like, 6-8 to eight spot, playoff spot. Um, I think that little cluster of teams right now is really ultra-competitive, and it'll be really interesting to see where teams look uh, after, you know, the end of this week and, you know, moving forward. So both of these teams kind of fighting for that, you know, cluster of spots and both looking good in this one. Just FlyQuest obviously looking a little bit better knowing their win conditions and playing around them. That means we now get to jump into day two here of week two action. And that was kicked off with Golden Guardians taking on TSM. I was just hyping up TSM from earlier in this week from beating the undefeated super team, Team Liquid, blah, 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 blah. And here they go and lose to Golden Guardians, and they lose pretty convincingly. Um, this is like a 14k gold lead. Um, that's, at, you know, by the end of the game. Pretty nuts. Pretty, pretty nuts performance here from Golden Guardians. I love the draft. Um, let's go ahead and talk about their side. Obviously, people are going to be looking at the Dr. Moodno support, and they're going to be like, well, what's the point of that? Well, actually, quite frankly, this dismantled. TSM. This, this pick alone made so many things on TSM, like, pointless. The Yasuo couldn't do anything. The Seraphine couldn't do anything. It was really, really difficult for TSM to actually play this game out, uh, making proactive plays with Dr. Mundo kind of roaming around on the map. And, uh, that's, that's huge for Golden Guardians. Like, shout out. This is a really cool pick. Um, I, you know, Dr. Mundo is a pick that I think has a place in the meta as an interesting tank, both top lane and as you can see here as a Senna partner in support, but uh, I never thought it would be this successful. Uh, but really the the story of this game is stop putting Licorice on tanks. Um, stop putting Licorice on tanks because you put him on the Fiora and he absolutely styles on Huni this entire game. He's going to be my player of the game pretty easily. This was a pretty nuts Fiora game here from Licorice. Obviously the big outplay in the top lane where he dodges everything and then kills Huni and then dashes over the wall in the 1v2, like, awesome. That's really, really, really cool to watch. Um, but he was more than that this game. He was a huge nuisance for TSM to have to deal with. He got super far ahead. His split push was a problem. He could 1v1 anybody in the game. Uh, and they had nothing to deal with him. When, when Licorice is able to be proactive, and he was like this in spring as well, this team does a lot better playing around that top side. I hope to see it more uh, because it's something that they kind of moved away from towards the end of Spring Split, and I'm really not exactly sure why. I know Lost was playing kind of okay, but um, now that Lost is gone, Licorice has to be your guy here, and um, th that that showed for Golden Guardians. Everybody here played relatively well. Uh, not too much to talk about there, but for TSM, speaking of somebody needing to be on a carry in order for them to win a game, that's what Spika is to TSM. If Spika is on this Volley Bear and he can't, like, carry the game, it just feels like they're going to lose. Um, I really dislike the Yasuo pick here in the mid lane. I don't really think it synergizes all that well with your team. Your knockups are Yasuo Q and Nar. And that's only Mega Nar. And it's like, okay, well, I guess you might be able to do something with that. The Volley Bear pick is a complete question mark to me. I don't understand why you go Volley Bear here. Uh, I don't really see it doing much. Obviously, Diana was on the board. And so... Um, you, you, you wonder why they don't go Diana Yasuo, and then you could still go Seraphine, but maybe you give it to Mia, and you have, you run, like, a, you know, something else in the bot lane. I, I just don't get it. Like, I don't, I don't get this draft. Uh, they don't really have a lane to play around. Like, you have to have that be Yasuo here. And it was just never going to be into Corky. You have Mundo roaming around the map. You have Fiora obliterating top lane. 
TSM was just kind of doomed from the start here. My dud of the game is going to go to Huni because, like I said, it was a pretty big top gap in this one. But, um, yeah, as for the outlooks of these teams, Golden Guardians looks really good here. Uh, they've, they've looked rough to start the year, but having a game plan that looks so successful like this with playing around Licorice, having Ole on this kind of weird pick that can essentially nullify a few of the other picks by just being annoying is really good. 6A on Senna has always kind of been really good. It was really good in Spring and Academy. Uh, and then Pride Stalker and a Blaze Olive on just whatever they need to be. You see the Xin Zhao and the Corky here. Corky's always a great pick. Xin Zhao, I'm not super sold on here, but it worked out just fine. As for TSM, uh, I, you know, this is, they, they're the new CLG. They're the new, uh, we're going to beat Team Liquid and we're going to lose to Golden Guardians and we're going to be a below 500 team at the end of the day. And, you know, you have, this team feels like they have one strategy, which is to play around Spica and to have Mia on some sort of like team fight engaged champion. Renata was up in this one. So, you know, obviously is Renata scary, but they didn't go for that. Tactical is playing bad. There's really no other way to say it. He's been bad all spring. He was bad at the start of this split. He really needs to step up his game. He absolutely whiffed an ult, I believe, either a Baron Pit or Dragon Pit. It was a big team fight. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But he absolutely whiffed an ult um, on Seraphine that would have won them the fight and uh, just just didn't get it off. And then, yeah, Ma Ma you know, Maple was all right, but the Yasuo pick's just not going to do anything into this comp. So, uh, yeah, yeah, not, not a great draft from TSM, but I'm not too concerned. But I am really excited to see if Golden Guardians can kind of use this momentum to piece some wins together. Moving on to our second game here of day two, we had a really, really fun one to watch. It was Team Liquid taking on FlyQuest, a really big comeback here from Team Liquid, and in, in, in quite a short amount of time. Um, you can call it a comeback, you can call it a throw. I feel like y both are applicable in this scenario to an extent, uh, but I really want to give this one to Team Liquid. Like, they played really, really well. Um, I don't want to say that FlyQuest just kind of threw the game and Team Liquid took it back. They took control of this game, and they they won it themselves. Um, a lot of that was due to a phenomenal game on Swain here from Bjergsen. A really good bounce back from the weak game that he had earlier in the week against TSM. He looks really, really good. This Swain pick is really oppressive if it can get all... Like, if, if you're team fighting, right? If if you have these 5v5 team fights around objectives, this Swain pick is really difficult to deal with. And we've seen that pretty much everywhere in the world. We've definitely seen it in this game here because... Holy crap, that Swain was doing so much damage, and, and Swain can't die um, while in that ult. I find it impossible, especially with Lulu there. Um, but Bjergsen was the only one on this team who played really well. I thought Santorin's pillars were actually super clutch um, at some points in this game. I believe during one of those Baron fights, he stopped a Rakan engage with a pillar, or at least he like delayed a Rakan engage with the pillar. It was it was just phenomenal. Santorin on Trundle, obviously it's his signature pick. That and Volley Bear, I think, are like, what I think of when I think of Santorin, but, you know, Trundle, his, his Trundle is so good, and he's so comfortable on that champ that he played that really well, he had a really good week here for Team Liquid, and then Whippo, I thought was pretty good here on the Gangplank, those GP ults were doing so much damage, he just got to that point in the game where he was blowing people up, I'm still a little bit questionable about this bot lane, Hans and Kor didn't play very well towards the beginning of this game, Kor played a lot better towards the end, obviously the Lulu in those team fights is really important, but he had a really clutch pink ward around Baron Pit that was able to see Twitch right before an engage. That if if he didn't get that, I'm pretty sure they're all wiped. So really good from him there. But Hansam, I definitely still have some question marks about. He was not good in the TSM game earlier this week. And honestly, he wasn't particularly good in this game either. Um, he has not looked good at the start of summer. Hopefully he can figure that out. Like I said, he's been a little, I don't want to say disappointing, because like I said, he was good in spring. He just hasn't been the world beater that we thought he was going to be, and he's definitely taken a step back at the beginning of the split here, but hopefully he can figure it out and get back on track. As for FlyQuest, people are going to say that they threw this game. I do think they made some bad plays, but overall, I thought this game was more Team Liquid doing good than it was FlyQuest doing bad. Um, the dud of the game was actually really, really difficult to give out, because really, it, it is going to go to Johnson here in this one, but... He was the reason they were in the game in the first place. He was just also the reason that they lost it. He got po he got caught, got picked off twice. And if he doesn't get picked off in those fights, I'm pretty sure they just win the game. Obviously, if they don't throw at Baron, they just win the game as well. But, you know, some, some, some minor mistakes here from FlyQuest that allow Team Liquid to get the advantage. And then Team Liquid does a great job of closing that game out. But 
a good game played here from FlyQuest. They got the lead early. Jose Deoto had a really good one here, and so did Johnson and Aframu in laning phase. Johnson on the Twitch is actually, that's a pick I expect to see them going back to over and over and over and over again. I don't expect to see Yumi get through against FlyQuest very often because I imagine if this team gets Twitch Yumi, they're going to be very, very excited. They seem to play this comp really well. Afro had a really good game on the Rakan. Uh, Santorin outplayed him at a couple of different moments, like I mentioned, but uh, still a really good game on the Rakan. Uh, the solo laners are definitely a little bit of a question mark here for FlyQuest. Like I said, Philip has had some ups and downs. Uh, he wasn't particularly impactful this game. Tukuya had a phenomenal spring. I think he did better than anybody could have ever asked for in spring. He just has kind of been a non-factor so far in summer. None of these games have really felt like Tukuya's mattered in. And um, hopefully that can turn around because it's really been about bot lane and it's been about the jungle position. Jose Deoto with another good one here on Wukong. It's a pick that clearly he's really comfortable on. It's super duper strong in the meta right now. So I expect to see them grab this if they ever have the opportunity. Although this is the second game in a row where they have been allowed to pick Wukong on red side. So I'm not sure how much that is going to continue. But, uh, you know, a, a good game here from him nonetheless. If Johnson doesn't die at those fights, I, I really do think FlyQuest takes this game. And we're talking completely different story here. But as for the outlook of these two teams, uh, a really nice win here for Team Liquid. Um, kind of getting back on track here, a 4-1 start. You do have some question marks. The bot lane has definitely been questionable to start the year, but they're so talented that at some point you have to expect that they're just going to turn it around and get back to the form that we know that both of them can compete at. And then Santorin has honestly been maybe this team's best player so far this year. He has been quietly, like, really, really good. Um, and so Team Liquid looking strong, still looking like one of the best teams in the region. FlyQuest, on the other hand, good. They're looking good. Like like I said in the CLG game, they're right in that cluster of like CLG, TSM, FlyQuest, Golden Guardians, Immortals, like all these teams are like, even Dignitas maybe if they can turn it around, like that are punching it out for these final playoff spots. I do think that they have the talent to beat any of those teams on any given day, but they really do have to step it up. They looked good against one of the best teams in the region here. Hopefully they can continue that momentum throughout the rest of the season and, uh, you know, continue to have this bot lane produce at a, a a really high level. Moving on to our third game here of day two, we had a battle of teams that I think a lot of people expected to be near the top. We had Cloud9 taking 100 Thieves in an absolute stomp here for Cloud9. Uh, this is not how a lot of people would have expected this matchup to go after week one, where Cloud9 went 0-3, and 100 Thieves pretty much dominated everyone except for EG. Um, wow. What a shocker. Let's talk about C9 first. Jensen has an absolutely phenomenal game here on the Yone. Um, thank you to the people in the comment section who told me it was Yone and not Yon. Um, I will continue to say Yone now. <laughs> That's good. It's good to know. Um, yeah, Jensen was great. Uh, he had a really bad Yone game in week one. And I think a lot of people were really curious about that. Um, I know obviously he had that conversation with Double Lift where he was like, my Yone is clean. And then they look at the match history and it's all red and whatever, right? But like, his Yone was awesome in this one. He dominated the Azir in laning phase. There was absolutely nothing Abadage could do. Well, there there could have been, but there he didn't. Um, really, really good game from him. A really good game from Blabber here on the Gragas. This is, I think, more so than any other pick, like what I consider to be like Blabber's specialty in a weird way. Like his Gragas is just so ridiculously clean. It's always the pick that I think he's been best at. And I know it's not like his play style in the exact sense, but... He plays Gragas like no one else in LCS does. Really, really good game here from Blabber. Really good week from Blabber. And then the bot lane. Obviously, like I said, they come in, they were, they they get their starting spots back from King and Destiny with uh, Berserker being able to come back to the States. And they look phenomenal in this one. Berserker had a great game here on the Zeri. Zven's positioning on Lulu is just really, really solid. You can tell he was an AD carry player because he's actually dodging skill shots. Uh, just an overall great game. Fudge with the, the full damage build on Gangplank. C9 just kind of dominating. Everybody getting ahead here and everybody playing really well. As for 100 Thieves, this was not the look. Abadage is going to get the dud of the game. I don't think that's going to be to anybody's surprise. Uh, he was clearly the worst player in this game, and, and he's really been a question mark. He had a he had an up and down spring, uh, but he was not good in playoffs for this 100 Thieves team. And he has not started out in summer being good for this team. That's definitely something to be concerned about. Uh, obviously he took a huge step up when he got to LCS and joined 100 Thieves in summer of last year, but um, he has been questionable at best so far in 2022, and you're just hoping that eventually he can kind of figure it out. Maybe he's tilted, maybe he just, 
you know, is is in a bad and cold streak right now. It happens, right? Not everybody's going to be perfect forever, but um, he's got to figure it out soon because uh, he really, he got clapped. Like, he got clapped in this one by Jensen. There's really no other way to put it. Not that the rest of the team played much better. This Volley Bear pick is interesting. Like, I, I see a lot of people talking about Volley being a little bit of a trap pick here because it's not winning. And I just think everybody's playing it wrong. Like, I don't, you know, who am I to sell to tell pros that they're playing it wrong? But, like, to me, Volley's not a pick that you're supposed to power farm on and then try to make an impact in 20 minutes. Like, try to impact these lanes. Like, be super proactive in early game. I just don't understand why we are playing so safe on the Volley Bear. I get that the lanes aren't necessarily in the perfect wave state, but, like, Volley has a lot of pressure in those, like, two to six levels. I don't know why you're just not... Take, trying to take advantage of that, and um, Closer didn't in this game. He was very passive, and uh, I feel like pretty much every Volleybear player has been very passive in the LCS, and I, I'm just not exactly sure why that is, but yeah, uh, Closer didn't play this well. Uh, FBI and Huhi, you yeah, know, whatever. Someday, lost to Fudge. This was just not a good game for 100 Thieves. Uh, takeaways, uh, C9 looks really good. Uh, that's really what it is, right? They finally get their full roster in here. They win earlier in the week. They dominate a really good 100 Thieves team. That has, it's not like they've been losing. Like, it's a winning 100 Thieves team in this game. They absolutely obliterate them. And uh, Jensen looks cracked. Ber uh, Berserker looks cracked. Blabber looks cracked. Zven looks cracked. Fudge looks cracked. They just, they looked great in this game. 100 Thieves, they have question marks. Like, I'm not going to pretend like this isn't a little bit concerning. Abadage has to step up and Closer has to play a little bit better, but... Um, you know, obviously you have to have a little bit of faith in these guys. This is still, you know, we go back to it. This is still the same team that won LCS in summer of last year. So if they can just figure it out and kind of get their, their mental and their macro back on pace, then, uh, I, I do believe that they're still a top team, but man, this one was ugly. Moving on to our fourth game here of day two an absolute amazing game. It, one that you should go back and watch if you have any questions of why I think the CLG team is a good team. Evil Genius has taken on CLG. Uh, CLG wins this, and they really shouldn't have. Like, everything in this game, I feel like, was conspiring against CLG having a shot at winning this. The script was written, and CLG ripped it up. They threw it into the trash, and they said, we're winning no matter what, and they did Screw you, evil geniuses. I still love your roster. Don't this don't take this personally. CLG is the future. They are the present. They are the now. They are the everything. They are the eternal. Uh, let's talk about it. Um, really, the big takeaway from this game is objective bounties. <laughs> Do they work as intended? CLG's up like 1.5k. EG has gotten every single objective in the game, and they have objective bounties up, and it's like, well... Man, it looks like free gold for EG, and they get it. They get all these objectives. They get Baron. They get Elder. They get Baron again. They get Towers. They get Base. They get all these inhibitors, right? Like, doesn't matter. CLG's winning these team fights. Doka's an absolute schmonster on this Gwen, and uh, he's clearly the player of the game. An amazing game here from Big Dokes. Uh, kind of shutting a lot of people up. I think a lot of people were really surprised about Doka getting a starting spot in LCS. He has been, like, smurfing Academy for the past year, um, and Amateur as well. He's been so good over the past year that he finally gets a shot here back in the LCS on CLG, and he top gaps Impact. There's really no other way to put it. He top gaps Impact here on the Gwen. A great game from him, but a great game from everybody. Luger on the Kai'Sa doing a million damage. Contracts with those engages in late, you know, in the late game and the resets. Palafox looking good. Just CLG fighting better. Their macro is genuinely phenomenal. Like, they might have the best macro of any team in the LCS right now, which is certainly saying a lot, because I don't think EG's macro is, like, awful. But CLG's macro is actually just on a different level. As for EG, they were given chances in this one. They certainly were. Uh, and they stayed in it. Like, I don't want to pretend like they didn't try to take advantage of those chances. They just couldn't win fights. That really was the end of it. Was uh, EG just wasn't on that same level of CLG in terms of being able to teamfight, they were able to kind of grab some objectives. They were able to try to put themselves in a position to continue to stay in this game with the bounties. And uh, they they just couldn't. They came really, really close to winning this one. But just at the end of the day, they couldn't pull through. Uh, Impact is going to be my dead of the game. Like I said, kind of top gapped this game. Noko was just better than Impact for a majority of this game on the Gragas. Not exactly what you want to see. He was my vote for, uh, uh, you know, one of the better players in the league. 
last split um, and last year as well. Impact was awesome last year. Um, obviously, Summit was first team All Pro. I almost forgot that Summit was there. I was I was gonna be like he was my vote for first team, and I was like never mind. Um, but yeah, it's not that Impact is some regular top laner that just kind of has ups and down games. Like he's he's very consistent, and Dokla was just better than him in this game. Inspired had some questionable engages here. I hate the Xin Xiao pick. I really do. I don't really think it offers you much. They're just significantly better engaged champions, I think, to play right now than Xin Zhao. But the rest of this comp, I think, is fine. Um, JoJo with the Corky Rockets was was whatever. Danny on the Ezreal. Maybe you want something a little more proactive, but I'm not blaming the comp. Really, I think this was just a game of CLG playing really, really, really well. There was really no other way to put it. CLG looked phenomenal in this one. As for the outlooks of these teams, I'm not super down on EG, like I said. They're still a top team. They've dismantled uh, a lot of teams on their way to losing their first game of the split here. But uh, for CLG, this is a very, this is a massive confidence inspiring win. Like this is, this wasn't some weird fluky like, oh, you know, uh, they just weren't on their A game or or they just weren't, they didn't have chances. Like this was a close game that CLG played nearly perfectly. And, and for that, I have to give them a ton of credit. So a huge, huge up to CLG for an awesome win here. That brings us to our final game here of Week 2, a battle of the least. The, the two worst teams in the LCS, I think that's pretty undisputable at this point. You've got Immortals taking on Dignitas. Dignitas almost very nearly perfect gaming Immortals here. They do give up a Dragon, very unfortunate, but a, a big win here for Dignitas. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Biofrost before we do any of this. Congratulations to Biofrost on his 200th win. In LCS, that's one hell of an accomplishment. Really happy for him. Obviously, um, you know, ha having it happen during Pride Month after he just came out, like, awesome. Really happy for Biofrost. Congratulations to him. Everybody go say congratulations on Twitter. Um, but good win for Dig here. Uh, their first win of the season was pretty dominant. Uh, Immortals just looks completely lost. I mean... Listen to the freaking Kobe cast if you do not believe me. They flamed the absolute shit out of Immortals, and they kind of deserved it. Um, there is one competent player on this team, and maybe two, and neither of them played well in this game in particular, but, you know, at least you have hope for Lost in Revenge, but golly, man, Ken V has been atrocious to start the year. He's my dud of the game again here. Just an atrocious, atrocious start to the year for Ken V. Pretty much as bad of a start to a career as you could possibly have after being as hyped up as he was for years and years and years. After destroying Academy, man, going to Immortals and just playing like this is, it just feels depressing. Power of Evil is looking like the modern Froggen in the sense of like, man, I remember what he used to be, but I just don't know if he's that anymore. I don't know if he's a guy who can, can play in the LCS anymore. And to say that after he was really, I mean, this is the first year he's really not been good, but he's, like, making a case for being the worst mid laner in the league so far this year. He's been really bad. Ignar has just looked completely useless on the Yumi, just completely nothing. And Immortals just looks bad. But let's talk about Dignitas. Rivers the player of the game here on the Gragas. Uh, Gragas, Yasuo, you know, sure. You want to pull that off. Blue's a good Yasuo player. River and Blue have a good chemistry. They've kind of been the bright spots for this Dignitas team so far this year. And they looked good in this game. Obviously, everybody looked good in this game. They pretty much dominated from moment one. Gamsu on the NAR looked finally competent. Um, this was his probably first good game in the LCS so far since he came back. And then Neo and Biofrost were fine. They, they didn't have to have a huge impact here on the Senna Tom Kench. We never really got to that point. But uh, yeah, a good win for Dig, just generally speaking. Um, Immortals looks awful. This is really more about just Immortals not showing up, looking tilted out of their minds, and not looking like they want to play the game, like, at all. Um, they remind me a lot of what SK Gaming looks like over in the LEC right now, which is just like, I don't know, like, what, what's the point? What's the, what, what, what's the point of any of these players? And to say that, like, with this roster, like, the most hyped-up Academy jungler in a while, one of the more established mid laners in the region, an AD carry that was secretly really good last split, and a multiple-time Worlds participating support with a, a top laner that has shown to at least be playable. Like, for them to clearly be the worst team in the league, it just, you would never expect that on paper. And so, so, you know, you would hope that they'd be able to turn around. But honestly, they've done absolutely nothing so far this split to inspire any confidence that that is going to happen. As for Dignitas, a good win. You know, this probably brings them out of the 10th place spot for me, but uh, not much more than that. Immortals is a dumpster fire of a team, so I'm not really sure how much this win is on Dignitas and how much it is just, like, Immortals being bad, but 
you know, getting your first win of the split is always going to be a good experience, and I'm happy Dignitas could do that here before the end of week two. And that is going to do it for my week two LCS recap and analysis for all 10 games that happened across the two days. Up on the screen right now, on the left-hand side, you are going to see the updated standings in the LCS. Any ties in record will just be broken alphabetically. On the right, you are going to see my updated power rankings after week two. We'll go ahead and talk about the biggest risers and the biggest fallers. Uh, the biggest riser this week is, of course, going to be CLG. They jump from seven to five. They actually leapfrog TSM, even though both of them, uh, you know, have a one in one week. Uh, CLG just looked so freaking good in that win against Evil Geniuses in that second game. I actually, I very much believe this team is for real, and I expect this team to continue to surprise throughout the rest of the split. The biggest faller, no surprise, Immortals. I had them pretty high. Like I said at the beginning of the season, I had them five, dropped them to six last week. They go all the way down to ten. They have shown no fight. Yes, on paper, this roster still looks really good, and it looks like it should be a top six team, or at least a top seven team in the league, but they just, they haven't shown it. They have no macro, they have no draft, they have no fights, they have no nothing. And so, until they show anything, they're going to be in the basement, and uh, that's where they will stay. As for the players of the week, I'll quickly go over who my players of the week for week one were. Um, in week one, my player of the week actually went to Palafox on CLG. He was really phenomenal in that week one. Uh, really contributing to CLG's 3-0 start. And then my dud of the week in week one actually went to River on Dignitas. He had a really, really rough start to the year. Of course, he bounced back a little bit here in week two, but not a great week one for him. And uh, my week two player of the week is actually going to go to Jensen here on C9. That Yone game was really, really phenomenal. And he was also really good in their first game of the week as well. So a really, really good week here for Jensen. I believe the broadcast gave it to Blabber, but I thought Jensen was just a little bit more impactful for that Cloud9 team. And then my dud of the week for week one has to be Ken V, or for week two, I should say, has to be Ken V. Ken V had a really rough one. He's had a really rough start to the year. He definitely needs to turn around. This Immortals team in general needs to turn around. But Ken V is my week two dud of the week, and Jensen is my week two player of the week. So uh, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please go ahead and let me know down in the comment section below. Uh, leave a like if you did enjoy the content. Obviously, this takes a while to produce, and we are a team now, so it lets us know that we are doing a good job with these graphics and with the analysis and everything. Go ahead and leave a like if you did enjoy, but with that being said, I hope you guys are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day, and I will see you all later.